I don't care about my follower count or the number of readers I have, but I don't write for engagement. There's no doubt in my mind that if I didn't go some places and try to get at the root causes and do some more complex concepts, that it would be easier to read, it would be less work, and it would be more shareable, all of those things. But that's not what I'm writing for. I'm writing because that's how I think, and I'm trying to work out complex problems that I, I believe affect my life and other people's lives. Otherwise, like, what the fuck am I doing? I went to Hong Kong and worked in investment banking there just because I wanted to experience Asia and I thought, you know, I can learn about the Chinese market and, and all that stuff. So there I am miserable, decimating my liver. And it was just like a crazy year. I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't know anybody here. My friends are doing cool things back in the States. And I get a call from Sean one day and he's like, hey, I'm in LA. Like, do you want to try to start this company? And we're live, rationalvc.com. Iman, I think this one's been a, a very long time coming. I think we've been like two kids waiting for Christmas because uh, it's all, all of our worlds colliding. It's pretty much what our whole brand is based on. So uh, yeah, I mean, how, how excited are you on a one to 10? You know, I don't get, I don't <laughs> usually get nervous um, at all before a, before a pod. But genuinely, the world's colliding in this conversation that's about to occur. It has me a little nervous if I'm going to ask the like best questions that I possibly can because there's a lot of shit going on in my mind about this. We have none other than the exceptional Luke Burgess on the show. Luke is actually, so I made a LinkedIn post, I think it may have been on LinkedIn a while back, where I was ripping into the current founders joining Y Combinator and saying, you know, how it no longer consists of the nerds and the builders and it's now your typical Harvard MBAs. It went from going to Wall Street, now it's joining, trying to join YC. And I said, you know, typical thing where I just sort of shit on everyone. I said, you don't know how to think for yourselves and no skin in the game. Go and read One Thing by Luke Burgess. Uh, and to my surprise, wake up the next day and uh, Luke has uh, seen the post. He went on Twitter and he made a tweet, which we'll pull up in if you're watching on video. He said, P.S. Cyrus Yari has some Talebian style scorching commentary on the shark tankification and mimetic madness of the VC industry in his feed. Uh, and from there, a, a somewhat of a bromance was formed. Maybe, uh, you know. And uh, so, yeah, Luke, absolute pleasure. Welcome to Rational VC. Uh, man, absolute pleasure to be with you guys. I'm glad we finally made it happen. And that was a scorcher of a post, by the way. It was, um, <laughs> it was worthy of Taleb himself, I think. Thank you. I'm honored. Don't That's... feed his ego, man. <laughs> Don't feed his ego. <laughs> so, Luke, before, before we go, there's a lot to cover. Before we go into all, all of it, I guess the first thing I want to go into is if you can walk us through why you took a backpack full of books to a sports bar during the World Series. Like, what was going on there? <laughs> well, I have a bad habit of trying to get serious work done in bars and restaurants. Um, something about me, I like to be around other people and have ambient noise. It energizes me, even if I'm doing serious work like writing. So on that particular day, I forgot it was the World Series. I had no idea. So I go to this bar and I've got a backpack with me to research and write, wanting my book. Uh, and I'm really bad at book selection, man. I like I've got this like nervous thing where I, I, I worry that I'm gonna take the wrong book. So my wife thinks it's hilarious. I'll throw like six random books in my bag to get everything covered, fiction, nonfiction, you name it across the spectrum, so that if I get there and I decide that I actually am interested in reading something else, I've got everything covered. So that's what I did that day. And I'm sitting there, you know, trying to write with a bar full of Philadelphia Phillies fans watching the World Series, getting drunk. Um, I got about a half hour worth of quality work in before I just said, fuck it, and ordered a beer and just watched the rest of the game. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the, the, the logical uh, follow on from that question is uh, why were you trying to work in a bar anyway? So like what, what point in your life were you at there and what were you trying to achieve? Hmm. I, I think that I need like, um, it's a weird thing, man. Like I can't do one thing at the, at, at the same time, like full focus. It's almost like I'm more creative if I have multiple stimuli and inputs, uh, like crazy things happen. Like I've worked in environments like that and, 
uh, overheard a conversation or looked at somebody and seen something and it sparks ideas. It's a super weird, weird thing for me. Um, I've just had positive experiences. I do better work when I'm in a busy place, uh, certain kinds of work. But in that particular moment, I was actually writing a part of the book about uh, mimetic martinis and uh, social influences on like basic decisions, like why we order some certain foods and cocktails. So I thought that it would be fitting if while writing that section, I was actually in that kind of an environment. So your, I guess, uh, background or resume is nothing short of impressive. Uh, you know, you've f professor now, author, previously founder of four companies, uh, exits under your belt. Um, and, but before all of that, you were actually, you studied finance, I believe at NYU and you went into the world of investment banking. Now, unfortunately, this is something I'm also familiar with, uh, maybe for other reasons, but also probably due to a lot of, uh, mimesis, but, uh, you know, when I, I grew up as an immigrant in the UK and I, I, I had no clue what was going on. I went onto Google back in the day and I said, how do you get rich? And it said investment banking, you need to study econ or finance. And so down the route I went before realizing a few years later what a damn mistake it was. Um, but I guess walk me through, it's something we're familiar with, finance and consulting backgrounds. Why the switch? What was that experience for you like? Did, did you go through that for the same reason? And why the switch to startups? What caused the switch to the world of startups from banking? I think I went into it originally for a similar reason. You know, I got to NYU and what's the highest paying job I can get when I graduate? Um, and what are all the cool kids and the smart kids going into? And it was go work on Wall Street. So I just adopted that as my goal without giving it a whole lot of thought. Like, would I even like this kind of work? Um, when I was in, my reason for switching to startups is that the short story is um, my cousin who ended up becoming my business partner was a year behind me. He went to Columbia. He was a year behind me. And while we were in college, we put together this long business plan. Like now I hate business plans. I think they're mostly bullshit. I had spent like 50 hours putting this thing together. It was like 80 pages long. Um, I could have just been building the company at that point. <laughs> I, I put this long and we entered some collegiate business plan competition. And as you guys know, I hate those things. Uh, and, and I think we came in second place. So when it came time for me to graduate, Sean was still a year behind me. And I said, I'll take, I got really good job offers. And I said, I'm just going to go work on Wall Street for a while, um, make as, as much money as I can. Hopefully I learn something and then check back in with me in a year once you've graduated. We'll see if we still want to do this thing. So I, I'm, I, went in Hong, I went to Hong Kong and worked in investment banking there just because I wanted to experience Asia. And I thought, you know, I can learn about the Chinese market and, and all that stuff. So uh, there I am miserable. Um, you know, decimating my liver. And um, it was just like a crazy year. I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't know anybody here. Um, my friends are doing cool things back in the States. And I get a call from Sean one day and he's like, hey, I'm in LA. Like, do you want to try to start this company? Um, and I'm like, why are you in LA? That's like the last place that I want to move to. And he said, well, I met this girl and she's here. So if you want to start this company, you've got to come to LA um, and, you know, Within a week, I was on a plane to LA. <laughs> so um, I probably had a little bit of mimetic influence there because there, there was one guy that, that quit like a few weeks before me and went and started a company uh, in the UK, actually. And, you know, that I was like, wow, if, he's, if he could do that, I can do that too. And I saw the writing on the wall and I was like, man, if I stay here, I mean, I, I see what my life is going to be like five or 10 years from now and I don't like it. So, Sean opened the door and I walked through. So for those of, of, of the listeners or, or viewers that don't know, so you have a very eclectic background and you're a writer as well. I should say as well, because you're an amazing writer in and of itself. Thank you. Um, the, the thing I want to touch on is an article you've written and it's written on Epsilon Theory. And we actually did a specific podcast. We call them Rational Musings. We'll link here where you talk about a way, you know, 25 tactics for living an anti-mimetic life. Now we'll get into mimesis later on in this pod, but I just wanted to pick your brain on one of them. And it's something that Cyrus already mentioned, which is the shark tankification of work, of worth, I should say. And this is something really hard to even say, let alone understand. So I just wanted to get your view on what this is and in the startup community, what it means. So I think that 
the show Shark Tank has done more to confuse um, young entrepreneurs than practically anything else. Um, it took me a while to wrap my head around like what was going on there. Uh, and if you think about it, it's it's just introducing like mediators into the market who are endowed with this uh, kind of special status to judge the value or the worth of an idea or a company. Um, and there's all kinds of theater, theatrics, I mean, especially on that show. I mean, it's drama. And if anybody thinks that that's kind of how the real world works or pitching VCs, I mean, it's just not. It's television. It's drama. And... You know, you have, um, you know, these entrepreneurs who will go and, you know, the Shark Tank spawned this whole like um, cottage industry of uh, similar like mimicking like b competitions, business plan competitions, Shark Tanks. Like now every university business school needs to have a Shark Tank. Um, they're just multiplying all over the place. And because I'm a professor of, of business now is one of the hats that I wear. I see my students kill themselves to get this like recognition from these competitions and will literally spend kind of like my business plan in college will literally spend the bulk of their time entering these things, the incubators, accelerators, business plan competition, shark tanks, and judge the value of their idea based on the feedback that they get from two or three or four of these um, like divinely ordained, you would think judges in these shark tanks. And I'm like, dude, like, go to the market and let the market tell you if you've got something there. And, you know, don't, don't assume that this very small subset of investors who like to play this game are indicative of what you've created. Um, and it's the same thing with, like, self-worth. <laughs> People, you know, often derive their self-worth from in this fashion. And I think it's incredibly toxic. And we don't need those kind of mediators. I think there's some, maybe there are some positive aspects to this. But on the net, on the whole, I think most of them are just like uh, live action role playing and lead to some incredibly weird behaviors on the part of entrepreneurs. So similar to uh, Taleb, you are part of a very rare few professors in the world who went from industry to academia rather than, I guess, the reverse, which doesn't really happen. People are just lifelong academics. Uh, so t to me, that is, I guess, a real professor. Uh, but I guess as a seasoned founder as well, building four companies, what can, because a, a lot of listeners of this show are, you know, besides investors, a lot of founders and operators, what can many of today's founders become more aware of just extension of, I guess, what, what we just touched on now, but especially tech founders and Silicon Valley founders and all the tech Twitter bros and all these people who are, I guess, one of the reasons we started our brand was due to the uh, I guess the mimetic desire that we see in this industry, um, but what an extension of all the extremely logical points you just touched on, what can many of today's founders become more aware of when building companies as, as a founder yourself previously? Uh, I'll give you, you know, one I think is just be aware of um, the social forces that are at work and why you make some of the decisions that you do and why you pursue some of the goals. Um, you know, this is what my, a, a large part of my work is all about. Um, I, you know, I love your brand name is Rational VC. Um, I love it because uh, so much of venture capital is not rational. It's extremely mimetic and, you know, driven by bad social forces. And the same thing with startup founders. Uh, it's an incredibly, um, uh, I mean, it's like being in high school sometimes um, in terms of, you know, the social forces at work, uh, the status games that are being played. And the more that you become aware of those things, in yourself and in the in the culture, um, the more or the less time you waste just chasing stupid things that actually don't uh, aren't building your company um, are not contributing to any kind of growth, um, and, and and you know the more that you can decide what it is that you want to focus on because there's a lot of people out there uh, in venture capital and a lot of entrepreneurs that you know don't have your best interest at heart, um, and you know if you try to make everybody happy you're not going to build shit uh, you're going to be miserable. So you've got to find, um, there are great people out there though. There are investors that are wise and wise mentors and are looking out for your best interest. Um, so one of the most important skills to develop is, is discerning who those people are, um, having a really high bullshit detector and just not taking all of the memes and kind of like what we consider common knowledge on you know bro Twitter as fact because most of it is not. 
And then the flip side of the equation, Luke, is like the venture capital industry itself. So you touched on Shark Tank and how that's shifting the mentality of some people in the space and founders in the space. But it'd be interesting to understand what your views on VC is today. Um, we have some choice thoughts about this, but there's obviously a herd mentality that's emerging and uh, or that has existed really. Um, and like even the best investors in the space often follow trend. Um, so I wanted you to kind of maybe give us a view of what you think about venture capital today. Mm. I, I think in the last two years, it's been insane in the in the States. Um, you know, like Tiger is, you know, massive uh, VC in the States. And I, I've just heard so many stories about them um, giving term sheets to founders that they've never met, that um, they've talked to one time and are making offers within six hours while the guy's at dinner with his date or something like that. Um, you know, and I, I kept hearing like, well, the math works, right? Like it's just, well, the math may have worked 18 months ago, but it, it doesn't work like that anymore. And a lot of these firms are going to get washed out. So it's just, it's been extremely mimetic. Um, I knew that there was a massive bubble and it was total insanity when um, a large hedge fund in the U.S. basically came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in running a, like a $300 million fund for them. And they were like, we have no idea what, we, what you're doing. Would you consider helping us out with this? And I'm like, "Is no idea what you're doing. Do you? <laughs> um, I'm, not making, I'm not making this up. Um, and I was like, you know, maybe this isn't the best time to be doing that for even if I even if I said yes, um, I don't think that I, I could produce the kind of returns that you're looking for, given the kind of competition and capital that's flowing into these deals that are totally inflating values. Um, so I think I think that we're going to come back to a state of normalcy as some of these investments get washed out and people sober up a bit. Um, so the next couple of years is probably going to be a great time um, to find some actual value in the market. Yeah, I think we should uh, maybe make you a co-host of the show, given that uh, you're part of, again, a very rare few. So we had soft commitments uh, at the peak of the market and we decided, we made a whole episode recently on why we decided to not start a fund now. Uh, but for a, a lot of the reasons that you echo as well, uh, that, that you just mentioned echoing at those. So can you elaborate on cultivating, I've, I've made an episode before on, um, Charlie Munger, a lot of our brand is basically if you combined, I guess, Charlie Munger, uh, Nassim Taleb and Naval Ravikant, you'd basically have Rational VC. And I'd say your ideas as well. Um, and one of the episodes that I made was around Charlie Munger. He talks about these big ideas and cultivating an interdisciplinary mind or multidisciplinary, as he says. Um, can you elaborate on, on that and also the connection between Athens, Jerusalem and Silicon Valley? Hmm. And we live in a very siloed um, world, um, you know, where people are, you know, they go to school for one thing and that's what they know. And, you know, in some cases, you know, that's good. You know, it does create value, right? I, I understand specialization and division of labor and all of those things, right? I don't need to know how to be a, a software engineer, right? There are a lot of great people. I can't do everything. But the specialization has, I think, contributed to a lot of problems, right? There's, there's not a lot of interdisciplinary minds out there. Um, which leads to ethical, moral problems, right? You have doctors graduating from medical school that uh, don't understand like the first part of, of, of ethics, right? Bioethics, it's, that's crazy. And it's, there's a corollary thing, like, you know, I graduated from a great undergrad business school and um, I don't know, I had some bullshit one semester introduction and that was it. And so for me, the, I've learned as much, if not more from the humanities about business than I have from reading the latest nonfiction business bestseller. Um, just things about human nature, right? Gerard is one of these people. Uh, so philosophy, um, the, you know, the, it's, I just can't, I can't overstate. I mean, and just in life in general, not even in business, right? I don't learn just to make money and just to, to have strictly utilitarian sort of purposes. Um, the, the, this Athens, Jerusalem and Silicon Valley is a metaphor that I've used to kind of describe how, how the world seems to be clustering into these three cities. And Athens is the city of reason. Um, so, you know, you'd have like the rationalist community. Um, Jerusalem is uh, the world of religion and uh, extra rational things. And then Silicon Valley is this new force, this new third city that's kind of arisen in the last couple of decades that represents, in my mind, pure pragmatism and utility. May not be rational, 
um, and it may it, it doesn't account for um, anything spiritual whatsoever. So like we build tech without necessarily thinking about what it's what it's doing to us as humans. Um, in Silicon Valley, if it makes money, if the numbers work, the investment is made. So these these are the three cities, and that that framework goes back to a question uh, posed by a third century um, theologian, Tertullian, who said, "What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem?" Uh, very famous question has been debated for for centuries. And he was saying, what does reason have to do with religion? Like keep reason out of this, reason, faith, two totally separate things. So he, he made this division between the two. And as I reflected on that question, I thought, well, if Tertullian was alive today, I bet he would include Silicon Valley in in his musings because now there's this, it's, it's kind of its own thing. Now, of course, everything gets mixed together. I'm not suggesting that anybody lives in just one of these cities, right? Like Bitcoin was religious, there was rationality, and there was utility all in the same thing, right? But for the most part, I see a lot of clustering happening, and people from the different cities don't necessarily uh, travel to the other ones or sometimes don't even talk to the other ones. That is super interesting. Um, I'm going to take us on a tangent quickly before we come back to this, because I think this is a really interesting insight into the way you think. Um, and the way in which, therefore, you write. So you mentioned that in the same uh, article that you wrote, er that I mentioned earlier, you mentioned that writing to please is a recipe for lowest common denominator ideas and quality. The really interesting thing about you and other writers like Taleb or, or whoever it is, is that you go for root causes of things, even if that root cause is complicated and not easy to communicate to the reader. So, you know, I won't lie, this book is really interesting, but it's sometimes difficult to follow because it's so complex and you're trying to get to the root cause of things. A lot of people try to hide away from that and try not to find the root cause and just try to write to please. How do you get people to think more like you and maybe Taleb and some other writers like that and stop being so scared of who they, who they think they would be perceived as? Stop being pussies, basically. <laughs> well... You know, I'm not as anti-fragile as Taleb, right? Um, not quite. But I don't care about, like, my follower count or the number of readers I have. I don't, re I mean, I care a little bit. I'm not, I don't want to be disingenuous, right? I mean, I want people to read my writing. But I don't write for engagement. I just, I, I do not, I, I, there's a, no doubt in my mind that if I didn't go some places and try to get at the root causes and do some more complex concepts, that it would be easier to read. Um, it would be less work, it would be more shareable, all of those things. But that's not what I'm writing for. I'm writing because that's how I think. And I'm trying to work out complex problems that I, I believe affect my life and other people's lives. Um, so otherwise, like, what the fuck am I doing? Right? I mean, it's just, so uh, I think, how, how did I get to that point? Well, um, a lot of years of not doing that, of, of trying to please other people and realizing that it was just a never ending hamster wheel. And one of the things that I talk about in the book helps me a lot um, is like I, I filter uh, heavily like what I'm exposed to because I know that it can easily creep into my work and affect what I'm writing. So I don't read a lot of other sub stacks because um, if I did, if I was just every day I was just reading other people's writing. Uh, it would really like affect the way that I approach my own work. So in some sense, I, I shelter myself a bit from that so that when I sit down to write, um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm writing what I really want to write about and not what I think is like latching on to some kind of trendy topic or something like that. Another example, and, and often my first drafts, by the way, I, I, I scrap because I catch myself doing that a little bit. And I get, here's one very concrete example. Uh, I love this writer, Thomas J. Bevan. He's in the UK. Uh, he writes a substack called The Commonplace. And he broke me out of a habit of like f constantly like footnoting things and, and like writing in this very academic way. He told me, he was like, listen, I, I never do that. I just sit down and write and kind of loosely cite sources and it just makes my life easier. And, you know, I give myself a time limit. It's three hours or less. If it takes me more than that, I just, I just hit publish and I send it. And it's sort of it, that those are little tricks that I use to kind of break myself out of the um, out of the trap or temptation of trying to craft everything that I do to get like noticed in, in some way. And little by little, like, you know, I, I love my readers. 
because they're the kinds of, of people that uh, that care and are willing to do the work. And that's extremely satisfying to me. Yeah, lots of uh, golden points there. I mean, we definitely relate because I guess as essayists, despite having a lot less experience than you, but our blog has been running for two years. And I always say, you know, if you're not losing subscribers or uh, then you're not, you know, you're not being yourself or you're not doing something right. And uh, one of our three core values is authenticity. So for me, I mean, it's so important. I guess what I went through in the corporate world of it's just it's so much bullshit that at this point I would genuinely rather die than not be able to live an authentic life. It's that extreme. And that's like, I haven't even reached like, let's say the Taleb FU money or whatever, but it's still like authenticity is literally the number one core value we have out of the three. So uh, yeah, definitely relate. But I guess moving on um, to touch on mimetic theory and, and to go back to that, I guess a, a quick summary of who was Girard and more importantly, why was he less celebrated than other French uh, contemporary philosophers, in your view? Girard was uh, a French man who came to the U.S. after World War II. So, um, you know, he was in the U.S. for most of his life. Was in started at Indiana University and ended up at Stanford for many, many years, for decades at the end of his life, and put forward uh, mimetic theory, which was a game changer. Um, and and we'll get into that. But you know, why do I think that he's not as well known? I mean, I, th I think he is. Uh, it's funny, ironically, um, he, he's, he's become very well known over the last year or two. He would probably laugh. Um, part of it is just, you know, mimesis, I think. Um, is he just like the French philosopher du jour or something? I don't know. Um, I think he's one of the most important thinkers of, of the last century. Uh, I think that he's not thought of as a, as a Foucault or a, or a Derrida um, because he... Uh, not because he's harder to understand. I think it's partly because the implications of what he's saying touch on religion as part of it, um, and uh, and and I think there was there's a lot of like bias against that. Uh, and he was Catholic, and I think that hurt him in academia. Um, and I just think that it's his his theory is so rich and complex, um, and there's so many different ways that you could go with it that. It's just going to take time. I think that his time is, is coming now. Uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of his birth. So there's going to be a lot of events. I'm involved in, in, in hosting at least one of them, um, trying to make his thought more accessible. But there's, he, uh, he didn't do himself. He's, he's, he doesn't write in a clear way. Um, and that's why I felt that this project of writing my book was important to try to make it a little bit more accessible. So he didn't do himself a whole lot of favors. So there's Peter Thiel, who every tech bro that's going to be listening to this obviously knows who he is. And Thiel, you know, talks about mimesis, but doesn't actually talk about Girard in any of his books. Well, in the Zero to One, he doesn't talk about him quite interestingly, but he's, he's literally reflecting some of those points. He's done a lot to teach people about what mimesis and who Girard was. You've done also the same thing, right? You've tried to translate some of these complex concepts. Can you explain to someone who's not a tech bro, uh, who hasn't come to understand Girard's theories over the last one to two years, like you say, what is it in simple terms? Like to the level that I could just explain it to my mum. I love you, mum, but sometimes it's difficult to explain things. <laughs> <laughs> the, the core idea of Girard's thought is this term mimetic desire. And mimetic or mimesis is a, a word that means imitation or imitative desire. Um, comes from the Greek word that means to imitate. So his key insight is that human desire is imitative. That human beings are the most imitative creatures in the world, something that has been recognized for thousands of years. Aristotle wrote about this. We, you know, we imitate. It's how we learn language. Uh, it's how we are part of a culture. We learn social norms all through imitation. Girard's key insight, though, is that we imitate not just uh, surface level or superficial things, we actually imitate the desires of other people. So if I'm in school and uh, a good friend of mine um, all of a sudden wants to major in finance and believes that this is the key to a good and happy life, um, there's a good chance that I will, he's modeling a desire for something to me and that there's a good chance that's going to affect me right and then imagine if I'm in an environment where everybody wants 
uh, certain things, other things, like to participate in Shark Tanks if I'm in Silicon Valley. Um, that the desire is, in a sense, contagious. And Gerard said, we have this idea of our wants, of our desires, that makes them seem as if like we're the sole kind of generator of all of our all of our wants and desires that that it's they, they just come out of nowhere and he called that the romantic lie of what the, the, the romantic way of understanding our desires and he said you know in fact we're social creatures and most of our desires if not all of them uh, are mediated to us by by other people and that's what mimetic desire means so for basic instinctual drives like hunger or thirst. I don't necessarily need a model of desire to tell me or show me what I want. But when it comes to more abstract things like career paths or spouses or uh, hobbies or lifestyle, we don't have any instinctual basis for choosing between one, one of those things or the other, right? There's nothing biological, there's nothing hardwired that would help us to choose. So we, we look to other people to show us what to want. And it, this all happens uh, almost always unconsciously, subconsciously. I want to touch on something you said then. I think maybe it's been uh, exacerbated by, you know, social media and the frying of dopamine receptors, especially in our generation, Gen Z b b below us. But you touched on marriage or, you know, a, a partner. And uh, I guess many people, I, I think I had a tweet on this and it, you tweeted back at me, this was a while ago, but I mentioned how uh, something along the lines of many people choose a partner based purely on looks or education or social status or whatever, rather than compatibility. Mm -hmm. And I guess the dating scene in our generation and especially the generation below us is a minefield, uh, probably due to uh, mimesis. But what advice I guess would you have as someone who I, I believe you married last year and you were several years with your partner, um, what advice would you give to listeners on how to navigate this and I guess prevent the risk of ruin, seeing as a spouse selection is, as Charlie Munger puts, the most important decision one can make. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Charlie on that point, no, no doubt. Um, I mean, just think about all the, all the ways it shapes your life for the rest of your life. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that um, it's, it's important to stress test the relationship. Um, I mean, I'm, I met my wife very unexpectedly. I, actually, I met her at an Irish bar in Rome. Jeez, it sounds like I'm just always hanging out in bars. Um, <laughs> I, met her, I met her at an Irish pub in Rome watching American football, though, right? Totally unexpectedly. And, and you know, we, it took us, uh, we dated for six years before we got married. And, you know, we come from very different worlds, my wife and I. Um, she was the last person that I ever, like in terms of the attributes that she has, if I would have went on a dating app and, and, and I would have never selected them, right? But she's more wonderful um, and, and awesome and amazing. I mean, I'm not just, I'm talking like physical and uh, intellectual, spiritual, everything, you name values. Um, but she has changed my life. Uh, and we, we just, we, over a number of years, you know, we, we just went through so many different things, including the pandemic together, um, that we, you know, we, we exposed ourselves to so many stressors to find out if our relationship was fragile or not. So there's, you know, just going back to, to, to Lev's getting a lot of name dropping in this episode, right? But like, we, we found that our relationship was anti-fragile, uh, even after it was exposed to the most extreme uh, stressors. And that to me was really important. And, you know, you can't, you can't necessarily do that um, unless you, unless you make the commitment um, for a certain amount of time. I mean, sometimes you just know right away, but, um, you know, it's not a feeling. Um, it, it's, it's more of, it's more of a commitment that, you know, me and this person can, can handle anything. Um, I once asked this old, this old, uh, priest, like, this is like nine years ago. And I was like, you know, what's the most important thing to look for in a spouse? And I was expecting him to give me some pious answer. And he just looked me straight in the eye and he goes, toughness. He goes, life is tough. <laughs> And I never forgot that. And that's definitely one way that I could describe Claire. Uh, that's really nice. That's a, a very beautiful uh, ode to your wife. So I hope she listens to this. Um, the, the, the thing that's really interesting here is that you don't think that in uh, decisions of life, like getting married or picking a partner, 
that you are not in control of what you're doing, if that makes sense. So I feel like often people will will relegate certain aspects of their life to their unconscious, things like, oh, I can't sleep well, or you know, little things that you can understand why it would be tied to a subconscious or, or an unconscious. For example, putting trauma at the back of your mind. But the thing that's really interesting is that mimesis in and of itself actually explains things like relationships. So could you explain a little bit more about the wanting of things that idols represent and what an idol means and then how that kind of reflects in the relationship environment? So seeing someone date someone good looking, what, what does that do to your perception of dating? Mm. There was this comedian who was hilarious, and he goes, um, you guys know the actor John Hamm? He plays the main character in Mad Men. Yeah, so there was this comedian who goes, uh, it was like a Gerard, Gerard joke or something. He goes, yeah, I got this friend who's, who's all upset that uh, his girlfriend used to date John Hamm. Uh, and, and he's like, uh, dude, like John Hamm should be upset that the girl that he dated is dating you. And it was like, it was pretty, it was pretty funny. And it was just like, you know, how, how we're, we're constantly like evaluating like who people are with and, and sort of our perception of, of value is, is like derived from this, right? Like from, by social status, right? If like, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the captain of the sports team or whatever in high school, right? Like, um, I think that here's one way that it that it plays out in relationships and you like people listeners you should understand if you, your attraction is in some way being um being manipulated through like mimetic forces and you know one way that this happens happened to me before um you know dating somebody um i made the decision to end the relationship because i just didn't think it was a good fit it wasn't compatible um, and you know, they're, they're, they're just, I lost the attraction. And then two months later, seeing the the, the same girl, um, you know, with this other guy on social media, instantaneously like attracted me back to her first because I was alone at that point. And you know, this guy was really successful. And you know, for a minute, I was like, I think I actually do like her. I think I've made a big mistake. And it's not even <laughs> it's not even rational, right? Um, because now this other model came into the picture. Um, there's a, a Girardian psychologist who often does like couples therapy, and you know he finds that uh, some um, you know some husbands like are not no longer attracted to their wives after ten years or something like that. But this interesting thing happens where if some some of the some colleague uh, at her work all of a sudden is is interested in her or something like that. Um, it, it all of a sudden like changes the way that he perceives her. So this stuff happens a lot because other people do model model desires. I mean, this is what playing hard to get is all about too. Somebody's modeling an unattainable desire for themselves, right? Um, or if somebody seems too eager, they're they're modeling that they desire you you more, and that you know. So we we like things that are hard. We like things that are where there's obstacles in the way. Our perception of value instantly increases. So be aware of that, um, and even in even in long term relationships, models of desire come and go, and it's important to just be aware of who who might be affecting you. You touched on uh, comedians a couple of minutes ago. Would would you say that? I guess firstly, uh, what is a mediator? You know, how do you identify them or become one? And would you say? comedians are mediators uh, or idols a, a me yeah it's a great question i never thought about that so a mediator of desire is is think of a mediator as somebody that stands between us and some object um they're they're, they're mediating our desire or they're they're somehow affecting our desire for that thing they're bending our desire in some way um there you know it's almost like we don't have like our, our desire there's just not a straight line between us and the things that we want. So, so mediators are people that stand in between in some way, um, people that we orbit around. And you know, one way to find out if somebody is some mediator um, to you is, you know, do, does your thinking or life in some way orbit around them? Like, do you need to do you need to know what their latest um, purchase is what their latest tweet is in, in, in some way. Now, sometimes we just have genuine interest, right? We think somebody's thoughtful, smart. I mean, I, I, I do that with, with some certain thinkers myself, but it, when it becomes rivalrous in some way, um, 
when we're constantly sort of like looking back and measuring uh, and it's affecting our work, then it's some kind of a mimetic relationship, right? And, and perhaps in an unhealthy way. I think comedians are, they, they get like some kind of a special pass in society, at least they used to, um, where they could kind of say anything. And it's, it's not really the case anymore. Um, and the reason I think that in comedians, much of comedy is pointing out like silly mimetic desires. Almost the entire show Seinfeld is about mimetic desire, right? The characters are just like puppets of mimetic desire in that show. And I think one of the reasons that it works is that, um, you know, we, we stand at like a distance from all of those characters and we can laugh at them. It doesn't, um, it doesn't incite like self, um, self indictment of our own mimesis. You know, we, they, they seem so silly and the examples are so outrageous that we can sort of laugh at it. And I think, you know, comedians play a really important role in our society as, as like truth tellers. Um, and often they don't know that a lot of what they're doing is they're, they're acting as sort of like me, mediators of, of, of desire and, and of truth. Um, but, but they are because they sort of, they sort of stand in this weird space where they can, they can show us something about ourselves that we can laugh at. And the laughter in some sense makes it a little more palatable. This is, this is really interesting because Shakespeare, so Shakespeare himself often tattered as a comedian in his own time because of the way of his, of his writing and, and the points that he was trying to raise about society at the time. Um, Shakespeare is someone that Girard studied. Yeah. So, so Girard is an autodidact and we've actually had an episode on this uh, separately, but the fact that Girard was able to look into literature and understand that they were mediators and uh, sort of idols that cr created stories, really. The arc of a story is really often built around coming to a realization and changing your way. Often that's based on a model um, and you changing your behaviors on that basis. It, there's also an element of rituals that I want to touch on that's related to this. This is the bit that I struggle a lot with when it comes to, to mimesis. It explains things like religion, and, and I'll let you get into that. But the thing that I don't really understand about rituals is why are they important? Well, what are they? Why are they important in this context? Um, and then sort of why are they integral to, to life and society? Like, why is it that the story, the arc of the story always needs uh, an idol and therefore something becomes fitted within a ritual on the back of that? Mm. Well, this opens up the whole, uh, a whole nother part of Girard's theory which is um, the, the, the role of religion and rituals in, in human life. Well, what is a ritual in a general sense? My, my definition of a ritual, it, you know, it's some kind of a, it's, it's human, human behavior that has, um, that follows a pattern, right? Um, where the, the intellect is not uh, engaged, right? It's not, usually not always happening at the rational level that brings some form of order to disorder or some, or some kind of order to what would be chaos. Um, that's just in a, in a general level. Um, Gerard's theory is that mimesis, out of control mimesis, right? When people, everybody's imitating other people without realizing that they're hap that they're doing this, this leads to, this generally leads to conflict. Um, you know, if you're, if you derive some desire of somebody else, then you sort of become their rival. It's just natural. It just happens. Um, when this kind of spreads in an out of, out of control way through a culture, through a society, um, there's disorder. There's like di just di disordered desires all around. And he said that the, this is an incredibly, this is not an easy part of Girard's theory to understand, but he said the way that humans have traditionally solved that problem in the past is by singling out one person or one group as the cause of their chaos, the cause of the disorder, and expelling them, killing them, um, scapegoating them. And that unites everybody and, and brings order back to the society. That, that, that process, which the first time it ever happened was, was kind of a spontaneous uh, uniting, coming together around, around getting rid of this one person. But Gerard says that, you know, so think of a stoning, right? Um, a stoning's kind of like some, there's a crowd of people, somebody is, is singled out, and there's kind of a spontaneous stoning. Gerard said that human culture 
essentially designed designed rituals that would prevent the like the the original violence so like around the original violence um human societies invented rituals that would um resolve some resolve some tension and provide some form of catharsis without um necessarily having to commit the original violence um so uh so let me think of an example so an example of this would be um like rituals in in rome around um uh let's see like well in in rome they actually did uh sacrifice people in the Colosseum. so that's that's not the best example um but it, but again it that that is a ritual that it, that is a ritual that Gerard would argue contains a more widespread violence because it's a targeted violence that everybody can participate in, right? Um, so we have to ask ourselves, like, what are those rituals that we have in society? So religion, like, if you look at um, some of the rituals in Christianity, I think of like um, the Catholic Mass as a ritual. These are these are nonviolent rituals that remember a violent incident. In the case of Christ, to be the crucifixion, right? So there's this nonviolent ritual whose purpose is to remember the the violence that happened in that or that original in, instance right so con every single week right like remembering that so it's an example of a positive ritual and there are many negative rituals right like most negative behavior is ritualized right like i i've talked to people that are like have some addictions and what whatever it is whether it's porn whether it's drinking there's usually some like ritual process that leads up to them doing whatever the thing is that they don't want to do and if you can begin to identify when the ritual starts it's like the first step in not engaging in that behavior so if we extrapolate that to uh, human society and all of the rituals that we have like the cancellation mob like what's the earliest point that we can recognize that the ritual is starting to happen and if we recognize, most people don't think of the, the the process of somebody getting canceled online as a ritual, but it's a ritual. It's it's got like a very tight structure, including the apology. And if we begin to recognize the different steps in that ritual, we might be able to diffuse it a little bit. It's it's really interesting because it fundamentally touches on what you're taught as a kid around all of the. This is what I mean about the story arc, right? The character arc is that often there is a bad person, which actually could be representative of the scapegoat, uh, the baddie in the story. And often you go through this period of self-reflection and figuring stuff out as the main character, but then you come to a logical end that is the scapegoat going away, being killed, whatever it is, and then getting into a ritual of, I don't know if that's positive or not, but, but get into a ritual of the good times emerging again. And then you go through that process once again when everything's forgotten and the ritual passes. That literally just speaks to every single Disney movie I've ever watched. So that's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, the, the important part of, of the ritual is the catharsis, right? There's there's something that makes us feel good, um, and that's that's and 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 that prevents us from further conflict. Um, there's there's something like if, if it didn't have that cathartic effect on us, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't engage in it. So I think there's there are some really important rituals. I think one of the the wisest bosses that I ever had was my the managing director at my investment bank in Hong Kong. Uh, and Steve, uh, of course, he'd never read Gerard in his life, but he, he organized a paintball day for the entire office. And he turned to me and he goes, Luke, I hope you're at this, this paintball event. He goes, we really need to do this. It'll be cathartic for us. And I've always remembered that. I was like, here's a boss that probably understands more than he even realizes about how to how to uh, keep this place from going fucking crazy. We all get to go shoot at each other with paintball guns for an afternoon. Yeah, we, we needed that in the bank that I was working in, I think. But anyway, um, so we, we have a running joke on the pod, which is that when we start to mention Taleb too much, it's like every time you mention him, we say, take a shot. But to, to bring him up one more time, and I guess take a shot, is uh, he has a, to ex an extension of your ideas and what you just touched on. He has a phenomenal paper, which we'll link in the show notes, published in 2014 called Religion, Heuristics and Intergenerational Risk Management. And actually touches on the, some of the points that you just touched on and how much of the values that one is taught or the rituals are, um, how it in, gets interweaved into your life, I guess. It, it prevents 
uh, moral hazards or the risk of ruin, as he puts. Uh, so to, I guess, totally agree and um, we'll link that in the show notes for everyone to read. I guess moving on, can th- th- this is the golden question, I the million dollar question. Can we not be uh, mimetic and is it worth chasing anti-mimesis? Um, and, and how so if, if, if one wants to, uh, you know, chase such a thing or obtain such a thing? According to Girard, it's, it's not possible to escape mimesis, right? It's just we're social creatures and um, mimesis is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. There's just positive forms of mimesis and there are negative forms of mimesis. But the default mode seems to be the negative form for most of humanity. Um, it's kind of just the, the default direction that we head into seems to be conflict and rivalry. So I do think when I use the term anti-mimetic, um, I'm talking about escaping the negative or destructive parts of mimetic desire in order to adopt healthy, positive mimetic behaviors in place of them. So, you know, positive models of desire um, that help us um, in our lives, right? Was to be better people or, or to, to, to be better uh, work, at work, whatever, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, we do rely on models. And uh, if we don't choose them, then they'll be given to us by our culture, our society. So we all have models and um, the, 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 the difference is some people have chosen them, but most people haven't. So I think it's worth, um, obviously, I think it's worth uh, trying to be anti-mimetic in some ways, right? Um, it's why I wrote, I wrote a, a long substack uh, about it. Um, so, you know, in, in, in my life, I mean, there's silly, stupid ways that it's helpful, um, you know, at the level of, um, you know, like my wife and I, for instance, like uh, often go out and eat out on like Wednesdays. I go to the golf course in the middle of the week and there's nobody there. Um, I mean, little little things like that, like make my life a little bit better. And I would consider that like an anti-mimetic um, act, approach, right? It's like one of the beautiful parts of, you know, being my own boss. And, and I, I have that flexibility, so I take advantage of it. Um like so many things, even though even the five day work week and the hours that we work, right? It's a very mimetic phenomenon, and we just accept it without even thinking about it. Like, why do we do certain things at certain times? I mean, I think that's all a product of mimesis. But in the you know the more important aspects of that of, of being anti mimetic come down to um, you know be thinking more independently, um, making decisions, like checking ourselves when we find ourselves being influenced in unhealthy mimetic ways. Uh, it happens to me, it happens to everybody, I think, but I, I just, I'm able to usually recognize it and catch it uh, pretty soon. Um, so yeah, I do, I do believe it's kind of like a muscle or a habit that needs to be developed, right? And, and, and worked at, and the more you sort of work at developing these anti-mimetic muscles, um, the easier, easier it is. And the, the sort of the quicker you recognize when you're getting caught in unhealthy patterns. There's, so there's two sides to this that you've explained. The first side is positive, set, second side is, you know, negative. Can I just double click on the negative for a second? Um, If you read, so one of the things I read at university, which was not boring, uh, was, um, shout out Paki for that name, uh, is basically the concept of virtue and fortuna within the the prince for for Machiavelli. And the, the concept of virtue is really, you know, having the attributes that can make you a strong prince, whereas you're constantly in a battle against fortuna, which is essentially... The, the, the things that are outside of your control. Often I think of mimesis that sits between the two because you're kind of in control of it because it's coming from you, but it's also completely out of your control because it's in your unconscious. C- can you explain sort of, you say in your book that, that to use mimesis to target your enemies is missing the point. Can you explain this a little bit more, maybe in the context of virtue and fortuna, but, but generally speaking, what was going through your mind when you said that? Well, Machiavelli would disagree with me on that point, no doubt. So um, I, I say that um, from a moral standpoint, that I, that, um, I, I don't think it would be, I think that it, it's incredibly effective. So it's not missing the point if you are seeking um, power in a Machiavellian way. And there's many people right now doing it, at least in American politics. And um, some of them um, have, I, I know, are explicitly um, using sort of mimetic tactics, right, to make scapegoats of people on the other side, because it's highly effective. 
Right? These are people that actually know Girard. It's kind of scary because when you weaponize this, this powerful of a force. So it, it is effective. Um, I think it's miss when I say that it's missing the point, it's because um, I think that ultimately that will cause widespread um, societal destruction if, if, if everybody begins to do that and mimics it um, when it's weaponized like that. So I am very much uh, on the side of, um, of not weaponizing mimetic tactics and using it as uh, hopefully at the, at the risk of sounding cheesy as, as a force for good um, and, and not using other people. Um, and that's, that's the thing, right? I mean, you, you, using other people to achieve some goal um, for me is unethical. And, and the reason I ask this is because you've got examples of Edward Bernays that you talk about as the father of PR, but there's also other guys like um, Ernest Dichter, who was actually worked next door to Freud. And if, for those that don't know, Edward Bernays was Freud's nephew. Um, th he sort of made the Barbie doll popular. He, he kind of made uh, the Betty Crocker foods popular through um, focus groups. He actually created the focus group. And a lot of that was based on what, other, what people thought... Uh, what people desired on the basis of other people's desires. Now, although they never really talk about Girard, that's exactly what they were doing. And it seems like that's super negative. That's like a really bad way to use mimesis, but it's been, it's the only way I can see that it's been used in society to date um, in a super powerful and effective way, which is why, which is why I asked the question. Right, you mean, so it's like for marketing purposes, right? Exactly. To, to, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think everybody does it. And, you know, to, to market something and use mimetic desire, right, um, is uh, as long as the, the, the thing itself is, is there's nothing morally um, wrong with the thing itself is to me is neutral, right? I mean, like people uh, have the, have this, but this is why it's important that people understand the, the, the forces that are at work on them, right? People are adults, are, are free people. And like this is the this is the world that we live in, and I don't think that should be, you know, we can't regulate that. <laughs> um, it's just this is just the way that the world is, right? And people will always use these mimetic tactics to to sell things. You just need to need, need to know that you're being sold to, and like the forces that went into you desiring uh, the Barbie doll or whatever it is that we're talking about. So, Luke, what are what are some of your methods, I guess, of investing in deep silence, the great mimetic quieter? Uh, I think you've previously touched on learning to want what we have and uh how can one achieve this uh well this is the hardest question you've asked me yet because this is uh <laughs> this is a lifelong uh process um so I, I let me let me use this as an opportunity to i've, I've never i haven't announced this yet but so i am currently i want to sort of put my money where my mouth is and i want to invest in things that i think will actually help people understand um and battle some of the unhealthy mimetic forces. So uh, over the next few years, I'm, I'm in the early stages of organizing basically what you could call a micro retreat, uh, sort of Friday through Sunday, three days. Um, I want to have I want to have them all over the world. I'm going to have the first couple here in the U.S. Um, I'll be at all of the first you know dozen or so um, the whole time, and sort of leading people through kind of you know the Saturday is completely silent. No, there's no talking on Saturday. So we get there, we have dinner, um, and, and it's the, 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 the process of this, I mean, it's, it is for wellness, but the process of this is to grow in greater, greater awareness. I and mean, this is an ancient practice, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to sort of make it a bit more palatable and, and bring it to more people. So, you know, that's, that's something that I'm working uh, hard on right now, um, because I know that that's been incredibly effective for me. It's something that I do every year, and I want to give people a taste of that of like what it means to actually uh, the terrifying experience of having to be with yourself uh, for more than an hour with no devices and no technology um, with other cool people that also care about this stuff. So, you know, that's, that's something that's coming. Um, I'm working on that. Um, you know, having friends, one of the things I talk about in the book is, as you know, um, an organization is only as healthy as this, the speed at which truth moves through it. Because the truth is how we adapt to reality, right? And uh, to the extent that people are not telling the truth, uh, shielding other people from the truth, um, we we never grow, right? So having, for, I mean, honestly, like the older I get, I'm 40 now. The older I get, the more I am really, um, really 
critical, not critical, critical is the wrong word. The more I am uh, selective, I am about the, the friends and the company that I keep. And the number one thing that I look for is, is people that are willing to tell the truth. I don't want yes men around me. It's the same with my company, the same with my work. Um, I want people that are willing to tell me the truth, even when it's tough. And I try to like cultivate a culture of, of truth telling um, and, and, and quick truth telling, right? <laughs> uh, so we can move at the speed of truth. Uh, and that doesn't come easy for most people. I, I sense like you guys have are, are, are great at this, actually. Um, but most, so many people are so... A part of my job as, as a leader is getting people to quit being so fucking afraid of just saying what they think, saying what's on their mind. And I have to work really hard. It might be my primary job is just helping people to, to, to get it out and to tell me the truth, right? It's like when I've written complete shit, you wouldn't believe how hard it is. I send it to five people and everybody just tells me it's great. And I'm like, guys, it's complete <laughs> shit. Tell me the truth. Someone's going to do it, Luke. Someone's going to do it. It's funny you say that, that. I told you the first value we have is authenticity. The second one on the website printed in bold is truth seeking. And the third one being long termism. So I think it's been confirmed. We do have to make you a co host. And uh, we'll, we'll be there at the retreat. We'll be at the first one you host in Europe or UK or whatever. Um, and yeah, I guess before we start to wrap up, what, what can we learn from learning to navigate without GPS? This is a point you've touched on before. Learning to navigate without GPS and I, I guess applying this to our lives in general. So this comes from. Um you know, I, I learned this lesson. I relied on GPS for many, many years, and um, all of. And I realized, like all of the best experiences that I've had have come um, when I when I've gotten lost, right? Like Anthony Bourdain uh, talked about this in a beautiful episode, right? Just like the, when you run into some random people at the stop in at this restaurant you didn't even know existed, because the GPS never would have led you by it in the first place, right? That's why I love traveling so much. And uh, when I travel to foreign countries, I I, I don't schedule a lot. Um, we had to take a shot. This is a Talebian point here. Right? Uh, no, it's only it's only eleven o'clock in the morning. Here, right? But I, I I do. I like to meander through the streets. Um, I like to not have flaneur. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's an Italian version of that. Medigiando, um to while away the afternoon without any agenda. Um, so um, th so as I've thought about this, so what does that mean, right? Um, well. First of all, I think I just become stupid when I navigate with a GPS. I'm just like doing with this fucking screen. It's going where it tells me to go. I'm not even exercising my mind. So I, we, it, we just moved to a new neighborhood here in Michigan, and I don't, I don't know it very well. And I just force myself to just find my way to play. I mean, I can get anywhere I need to go. I kind of, I know the general direction it's in, and I just enjoy it, right? I mean, there's this cult of efficiency where I, you know, we have to get from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. And I kind of rejected that mentality a long time ago because that's not what life is about, right? Um, so it applied to life, I think, let's think about like, um, like best practices. So I think like that's like the, that's like the GPS version of, 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 I don't know, starting to, I don't know, whatever it is that we're doing, there's often like this template that, that exists out there that people like slavishly follow the way that they that we follow a GPS and like who even decided I, I mean there's wisdom in best practices but like especially in a startup world like there really aren't that many best practices because your company is so unique what you're doing is so unique like you need to figure things out and I think like becoming less like take your hand off of off of the the, the the railing and just like get your sea legs right people always need something to hold on to and I think that's really important to learn to let go of that railing. It's like my students, right? They get to college. And what, they, what the main thing that they learned in high school is how to follow directions. And my main job is kind of like the truth, you know, getting the truth out of people. My main job is just encouraging them to, to think for themselves, right? Like, you know, Professor Burgess, what font does this paper need to be in? I don't know. Like, I'm not going to tell you that. Um, you know, you could write 50 words, you could write 500 words. They just need to be good, right? Like stop, you know, stop relying on other people telling you what to do. So that's kind of my riff on, I, I think the GPS analogy applies to all different kinds of things in life. You heard it here first. So you got a Rational VC exclusive talking about his new boot camp uh, that's going to be coming soon. Hopefully come to the UK and we can go on it as well. And you heard it here first. If you're in Luke's class, write 50 words. And if it's good enough, you'll probably get an <laughs> Oh, no, I hope none of my students listen to this. <laughs> um, look, thank you very much for your time, Luke. We're going to wrap up now. Uh, where, can, where can people find you? 
uh, LukeBurgess.com, and I write a Substack newsletter every week called Anti Mimetic. Um, and if you're not the kind of person that likes to slog through uh, an 80,000 word uh, book, um, the video version of Wanting is coming out today. Um, well, when we're recording this conversation at least. But So by the time you listen to this, the video book of Wanting will also be out. It's about 45 minutes of me narrating the whole thing. Great. We'll link everything you mentioned in the show notes plus the book, uh, the Amazon link. And I guess that's it, Luke. It's been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to meeting you at the retreat. And I look forward to your, uh, you know, the truth truth seeking truth telling authentic luke burgess killing it I, I look forward to continue watching this journey it's it's been a pleasure well i'm a, I'm a co-host now so we you know, <laughs> there, there you go exactly um, no it's, it's been an, been an absolute pleasure guys let's uh, continue the conversation sometime for sure for sure yes, thank you. thanks so much ladies and gents luke burgess